Hi, this is Dr. Josh Turknet, founder of BrainJo. Welcome to Musicality Now. Hi, my name is Christopher. I'm the founder and director of Musical U, and welcome to Musicality Now. Today's interview is among the most fascinating we've had on the show to date. I'm joined by Dr. Josh Turknet, the neurologist, best selling author, and musician behind BrainJo. That's a music learning methodology which originated on banjo but applies across all instruments. And it's designed to leverage modern scientific insights on how the brain actually learns. At the BrainJo Center for Neurology and Cognitive Enhancement, Josh tackles the question Is it possible to take any ordinary adult brain and turn it into the brain of a musician? And finds plenty of evidence that the answer is yes. Josh is also the host of the Intelligence Unshackled podcast which focuses on how to optimize the health and function of the brain, including its capacity to learn and change itself. If you've ever wondered how exactly the brain learns new things, or whether your music learning process is really dialed in to help you learn as quickly and enjoyably as possible, you are going to absolutely love this one. In this conversation, Josh shares a completely new way to think about how you're spending your music practice time, an explanation of how to use visualization to help you improve faster, and when exactly to do that visualization. And he shares his so-called labyrinth technique, which helps you focus your practice time on what's going to deliver the biggest impact. We also talk about how playing by ear on banjo is and isn't different from other instruments, how playing complex music by ear actually works, and how the adult brain compares to the child brain for learning, and a whole lot more. If you don't come away from this with at least one new idea that changes how you think about your music learning, I would be shocked. I suspect you'll come away with several, as I did. My name's Christopher Sutton, and this is Musicality Now from Musical U. Welcome to the show, Josh. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me, Christopher. You are the most fascinating blend of musician and brain scientist that I've come across in a while, and I, I have to say... As I look through your websites for BrainJo and the BrainJo Center, I was just continually saying, this is so cool. Well, thank <laughs> so you. I've really, I've really been looking forward to this and the chance to unpack some of the topics you cover at BrainJo and the methodology you bring to music learning. But you are a musician, as I said, as well as a brain scientist and a kind of avid student of all the latest in learning theory and brain development. So I'd love if we could begin with your musical backstory, if we may, and what got you into music in the first place and what that looked like. Sure. So, you know, I've been interested in music for as long as I can remember, probably like most human beings. Um, and, uh, you know, first initially through singing. So, uh, you know, one of my, my earliest memories are going out on my swing set and singing, you know, the songs, my favorite songs of the day. And, you know, that had to been, I was three or four years old. Um, so, you know, first through singing and, and then, uh, I grew up in the era when the um, uh, keyboards were hitting the market, you know, the Casios and things like that. So my brother and I had one that we liked to mess around on. And, uh, and that was kind of, that was the first time that I, you know, played an instrument, uh, so to speak. And it was also the first time that I'd ever, you know, done anything like trying to play by ear other than trying to sing by ear. So that was kind of the first um, early exposure uh, to, to playing. But, um, and I wanted to do more. Uh, I wanted to, and I really wanted to play, you know, become a better keyboard player or a better piano player, you know, kind of wanted to be able to play the songs that I heard on the radio, right? Um, and figure out how to, how to make that music myself. And, you know, I knew from my experience that there was, that the ability to play by ear was possible, right? So we could pick out little melodies on the keyboard. Um, but I didn't really know you know, where to go from there. Like, I didn't know how, you know, what steps to take to go from play the music that, that I could do there to like playing something fully formed that, you know, that sounded more complete and comprehensive. And so, and the only thing that was really available in terms of instruction was, you know, people teaching to learn to read sheet music, to learn by rote, you know, the kind of the classical music approach. And, you know, a couple different times um, took lessons, which where, where that was the approach. And it just, it just wasn't really, it wasn't the thing I wanted to learn. So it didn't really click with me. You know, I was able to play some songs and stuff, but it, it, it still, I was still looking for someone to kind of show me the path towards, you know, what, what playing by ear would look like. Cause it felt very different. It was a very different way of making music. And, and, uh, 
and sort of the by rote approach um, kind of took a lot of the fun out of it for me. So, but I, but it was still, you know, back then, even this idea around, and it's still pervasive, but it was even more so back then because we didn't have the internet, you didn't have other, other, you know, exposure. So it was this idea that like, you're a few people out there who were born with this ability to learn by ear, right? And it was just like, they just walked up to a piano and just played everything they heard. You know, it was just like, it just happened by magic, right? And there was nothing in between. So it was this idea that, you know, you either were born with that capacity or not, and there was really no nowhere to go to learn how to do that sort of thing. So I kind of resigned myself to that idea um, for a while. And, um, and you know, would still, still mess around on the piano some, but, um, but kind of like put it aside for a while. And then it wasn't until... I was uh, in, let's see, I think my last year of medical school where I got a guitar and, um, and just playing, you know, getting the guitar and learning chords where, you know, the guitar tradition at that point in time, you know, there was the internet, you know, I have, was able to get some, some access to it some instructional materials and there was enough there that I could sort of start, you know, figuring that out by ear, you know, just learning chords, learning to play and sing along. And that got me completely excited about uh, playing music again. And it, you know, it felt like, you know, I, I kind of understood then where I could go from there and, and to, to kind of do that, to play the kind of music that I wanted to, to play. Um, so messed around the guitar, kind of learned, um, uh, learned, you know, strumming and singing styles, learned to play some flat pick um, uh, bluegrass style, and then moved into playing some uh, country blues, uh, finger picking, um, and then uh, one faithful Christmas, I was given a banjo uh, by my family who I'd expressed an interest for, for quite some time that one day I would like to learn how to play the banjo. So uh, my brother was the instigator who, who, who ended up uh, getting it for me and um, really fell in love with the, the banjo as an instrument. And so then, you know, was hooked on that, learned several different styles of, of banjo and then, you know, since then, it's been learning other instruments, fiddle, going back to piano, sort of, you know, as I, as I figured out, you know, things about how to, how, to, how to learn to play by ear, how to make my own music, went back to these other, you know, instruments that I tried to learn on before and applied those same concepts and, you know, made the kind of progress that I'd hoped to make so many years ago. So, so that was, that's kind of my journey in a nutshell. And it also, you know, a lot of the, a lot of what I'm doing now with Brain Joe is kind of reaching back to try to solve some of the problems that I'd faced long ago and sort of, de you know, demystify a lot of the stuff around learning by ear, providing pathways for people to do it, make it not, you know, make it not so intimidating because, you know, we're, we're all, as, as I think you guys feel as well, we're all wired to make music. It's just, it's just trying to figure out, you know, how to tap into that best and um, giving people ways to do that. Awesome. Well, I'm always conscious that whatever episode we're doing might be the first episode anyone's tuned into, like someone listening, it might be their first episode. And a moment ago when you talked about the idea back when you were growing up that, you know, playing by ear was an all or nothing gift, mm -hmm. you and I have a shared understanding that, you know, that that's not reality. And we can talk a lot more about that. But if someone's listening and they're like, but wait, isn't, isn't that the case? If they've never come across this idea that actually that's not how playing by ear works, could you just explain in a nutshell why it isn't that magical gift or why maybe why we ended up with that cultural assumption that it was too? Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, the, why we ended up that is a, is a good question. Um, and, and you're right that I kind of take for granted that that people realize that it's not this all or nothing thing nowadays, but it's not true. I was at dinner with someone just the other night who said that very thing. Like it's, you know, we we're having this conversation about it's, you know, it's all or nothing. So it is the, probably one of the most important points to make about it is that it is a learned skill, um, like any other part of playing music. So just like, you know, playing a scale or learning how to fret a chord or whatever, you know, playing by ear is a skill that can be developed. Um, and so, you, you know, part of that is having a roadmap. So how do you get from, um, you know, start, a starting point to being able to pick out songs by ear? But the, the you know, one of the articles that I've written about on this, on the topic, you know, talks about that in terms of what you need and the raw materials that you need to, to be able to play by ear, it's basically just being able to match a pitch that exists in the outs, you know, outside of you to one internally. And 
almost everybody has that capacity. So true tone deafness would be the, the absence of that ability, just like color blindness. You can't, you know, you can't perceive certain colors. If you're completely unable to perceive certain pitches, it makes learning by ear really tricky to learn as a skill. Um, but that's a really uncommon uh, problem. And most folks um, who have it aren't actually drawn to learning how to play music. So most people who are interested in playing music, uh, you know, are, are, are have the ability to discriminate pitches. Um, also, if you can sing, um, you're already doing that. You're already, well, all you're doing when you sing is matching an internal pitch representation with what you're producing with your vocal cords. Um, and even if you don't sing well, if you recognize that you don't sing well, then you also are matching internal pitches with what you, so that's a production problem, right? So there are two, two things that you have to have in order, in order to be able to sing on pitch, be able to recognize the pitch, and then able to have the control over your vocal apparatus to match it. Um, so if you can either sing on pitch or recognize when you aren't singing on pitch, then you have the apparatus, you're not tone deaf, and there are other ways you can, you can formally test yourself for it. But from then, from, from there, it's really a matter of um, having a sequence in terms of taking where you are at any point in time and then, you know, taking that to full on, you know, being able to play by ear. And there is a sequence, just like learning anything else. Um, there's a, you know, there's a progression of, of skills that it takes to, to ultimately get to the, to the higher levels that you'd want to be at. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's something that uh, anybody uh, can learn um, if they're given the right you know, pathway for doing it. And I think when you say the word banjo, people immediately hear banjo <laughs> playing in their head. And it's a fast flurry of notes and it's very yes. kind of active and energetic. Is banjo a difficult instrument to play by ear for that reason? Good question. Um, I think there, there probably is some yes i think there's if they, if you and depending on how you go about it or how you uh how you kind of deconstruct banjo playing so if you have a framework for understanding what's going on with the banjo when you're listening to it it makes playing by ear a whole lot easier so one of the one of the reasons for banjo having a fairly high failure rate um, particularly bluegrass banjo, which is the, you know, the staccato, really fast sequence of notes, is that um, people oftentimes try to approach it as if it's one single ent entity, like you're just hearing all those notes and you're just trying to replicate that without going back and seeing what's this structure that, that, that's, that's producing this, right? So it's really, you have these melody notes and then you have all of this stuff going on around it. Um, and there's more stuff going on around it than there are actual melody notes going on. Um, so if you so if you deconstruct it and start it from from the you know the the building blocks that are there, it makes it a whole lot easier. Whereas if you were to try to especially learn by ear, you know, even just making sense of what's happening is hard. Um, and then and, and trying to you know without some kind of slowdown software to even hear the notes, it's really hard. So it's far easier to um, start with you know. Every complex skill, right, is just an accumulation of simpler ones, right? So it's figuring out what's the simplest way to start with and then build on top of that. So, but absolutely, if you were to try to, to learn, and that's, that's part of the myth, right? That people would think that if you're learning to play banjo by ear, you know, the, the conventional myths that are out there, that that just means you listen to some, you know, professional banjo player playing this crazy, you know, sequence of notes, and then you just play the same thing on your banjo. And that's, that's how it works, right? <laughs> when it's totally not like that, right? So, so the first steps, one of the things that we do, that I do in the, in the um, banjo courses, the very first step in teaching to play by ear is first, we're list, we take recordings of, you know, uh, tracks of, you know, of professional banjos playing a song and then teach them first how to extract the melody from that, right? So the first thing you need to be able to understand is how to deconstruct what you're hearing into the component parts. And then the next step is then find, taking that basic melody, figuring out what are those, what are those notes? And then adding on top of it, okay, then what are the kind of the rules that banjo players use to decorate those notes, right? What are the extra sounds that you use? And then you can put those in, and that part is really just pattern based. So, you know, the real ear learning part of it is really extracting the melody and chords. You know, you're building your foundation and then you're using different patterns to, to fill it all out. But understanding that, I mean, that unlocks everything. If you understand the structure of it, um, whereas if you were just trying to do the whole thing all at once, it would be impossible for anybody. 
Absolutely. And you mentioned you play a few other instruments, partly mm -hmm. before banjo and partly since. Um, yes. How, how does that approach or that understanding of learning to play by ear compare across instruments? Um, I mean, I think it's probably, there are definitely some universals. Uh, for me, it's always about, you know, if you, always about starting simple and building from there with every, with everything. I mean, it's, you know, there's so much magic that happens when you just add a few simple things together, right? And it doesn't matter what instrument you're playing. And, and it's those, those moments when you experience that for the first time that are kind of like a revelation in music where you just, you've learned a few little things and then you put them all together and you're like, whoa, this sounds amazing. And, and you know, you feel like you didn't do anything that great, but it's, it's starting to come together. Those are powerful illustrations of that concept. But I think that, you know, ultimately, like, it's, it's very easy to get intimidated uh, by music, uh, whether it's, you know, a particular uh, genre that feels intimidating or an instrument that feels intimidating. But, you know, if you break it down to its fundamentals, you know, it's essentially just all frequencies of sound, you know, it's all the same stuff, you know, fundamentally. And then, and then it's, and then music itself is just melody, rhythm, and harmony, right? And if you just, you know, figure out, okay, what are those three components? And, you know, you can build up from anywhere. If you start there, you know, everything kind of looks the same, right? It's just, you just figure out, these are these same concepts applied to these different instruments. And I think once you kind of unlock those basic building blocks, then it becomes a lot easier to, um, you to learn, to apply them on whatever instrument. And it's really just a matter of learning mechanics of how that particular instrument works. Gotcha. And you touched on something there, which is really important, I think, which is we often, we're attracted into the process by the end goal and, you know, that fast flurry of notes that we want to be able to play by ear. Yes. And then we get into it and that's not what we're learning because we have to start from the beginning and we have to start from the basics. Right. And you have a lovely post on your site, one of the laws of Brain Joe is about motivation. I wonder if you could share um, the story you tell in that post about motivation and how to handle that discrepancy. Yeah, so this was kind of a, a revelation that I had not that long ago that seems kind of obvious in retrospect, but it clearly wasn't because it wasn't hadn't really occurred to me in that particular way. So, you know, one of the things that I'm really passionate about doing is keeping people from giving up. And there, there, are, there are different reasons why that happens, right? There are, there are limiting beliefs or mindsets about music or what, what it takes, the talent versus, you know, innate ability and all that kind of stuff. But, um, you know, so, so, so much of it is just psychology and, 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 and mindset. And one of the things that, you know, gets in the way is this, we come to music and, and we think, okay, we have some end goal in mind, right? So, you know, you hear, a, you have a particular pl player you idolize, you know, let's say, I want to be like that one day. Um, but that may be, you know, three, five, 10 years off, right? You don't, you don't, you don't know. And you really don't know what the path to getting there, you know, is going to look like. You can kind of only go to what's next in front of you and then keep kind of moving forward along that. So if you try to take that, if you were to just say, here's where I am now, and here's where I want to be. And you're just constantly like looking at that gap over, t you know, over time, um, it becomes a little bit demoralizing, you know, if, especially if you realize, okay, I'm making progress, but man, if I keep up at this pace, it's going to be 10 more years or whatever, you know? So that, so taking that kind of it, as your sort of only, um, you know, framework for assessing what you're doing is kind of a prescription for, for getting frustrated and, and giving up. Um, but the, the thing is, what I, with the revelation was that, that that's really not what keeps me going. And I don't think that's what keeps most everyone I talk to going. Um, what I realized was that the first, like where I am now versus where I was in the beginning, when I make progress or when I play a new song or something, it's, it's no more fun now than it was then. So those first few songs, I mean, I, I probably, even, I don't know, the, one of the most joyous moments was just being able to strum and sing my first song on the guitar. Right. And it wasn't anything complicated, but it was just like, you know, here it is. I did it. And it was felt amazing. Right. And each moment along the way of, well, of progress like that feels amazing. And it's not like, you know, once you get to a more advanced level, it feels any difference, any more amazing. It's all great. And so focusing on just, I mean, so there is a lot of reasons for why it's better to focus on the next step rather than the, you know, the step that's a thousand, you know, steps in front of you. Um, but from just from a purely, you know, from a pure enjoyment perspective, 
it's actually just as fun every point along the way. And I, no longer am I chasing any kind of, you know, idealized version of myself, you know, far out. Um, it's just about making progress and enjoying each, each time because that's actually where the enjoyment comes from. And, I, and, and there will always be, um, you will always uh, feel like you can get better. There's never going to be a moment where you say, okay, I've arrived. I'm done, right? <laughs> so it's, a, it's, a, it's an illusion anyways. So um, anyways, that's a much more helpful way, I think, to, to frame the journey in a, in a, in a way that uh, makes it a lot less likely that you're, you'll give up in frustration. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, you hear the advice, enjoy the process or enjoy the journey. But I think the way you just described it is so much more powerful because it makes that point that the journey is all there is. In a exactly. Sense, right. Right. <laughs> right. It's really it, it, right. It's the same concept, but it's like it's thinking about it in a little bit different way that makes it a little more tangible, I think. Yeah. And you actually add another strand to that, I think, in some of your work, which is we're not just learning music for the sake of learning music. For a lot of us, and I know a lot of people in our audience, it's also for the sake of brain development or brain um, capacity functioning mm -hmm. as we as we age, avoiding degradation. Right. And I, I love that you bring that perspective to it because I think it makes it much easier to enjoy the process, enjoy the journey and be a bit easier on yourself. Yes. Maybe you could just talk a little bit about why music is such a great hobby activity pastime for the sake of brain development and preservation. Yeah. So uh, one of the other hats that I wear is, is as a neurologist. And so over the years, you know, people ask me all the time, you know, what, what should I do? to help with my memory, what should I do to, you know, protect against something in you know, developing Alzheimer's disease or, you know, cognitive function declining over time. And they're usually expecting me to say, you know, do crossword puzzles or, so, you know, something like that. But I'm, uh, my answer has almost always been, you know, you either, you know, learn a musical instrument, uh, learn a language or learn to dance and things like that. So music is, uh, you know, there, I, I don't think you could argue that there's any better form of um, cognitive development than music, you know, just purely from the standpoint of the amount of cortical real estate. So the amount of the brain that has that's used uh, when you're learning music, when you're playing music, you know, there are a few things that compare. So, and what we've also learned uh, maybe in the past few decades in neuroscience is that um, new learning, so anytime you're engaging in neuroplasticity, so building new n networks, um, increasing the density of gray matter in certain areas, um, that that um, not only protects against uh, degeneration, but can actually restore the brain to a more youthful state. So there's some pretty remarkable research along those lines. So there's, the, there's sort of the, the cognitive benefits in the here and now of music, because uh, I totally uh, think that the uh, that building the kind of neural networks that are required to play music trans does transfer into other domains. Um, and uh, there's a, there's a uh, book called Range by David Epstein recently came out. Um, great book, but uh, in it he talks about um, Nobel laureates who are 22 times more likely to have had, uh, to be performers of some kind, whether it's mu musicians, magicians, um, things like that. And there's, you know, there's all sorts of research from that, that, that people who are sort of at the heights of sort of, um, of cognitive output, uh, per se, or cognitive performance um, are multidisciplinary, in particular in things like the performing arts. So I don't think that's coincidence. Um, I do think there's real uh, benefits in the here and now for, for cognitive function, but also in protecting the brain over time. So I think there's enough evidence to uh, indicate that when we learn new things, um, the brain takes that as a signal that we need to keep this apparatus around um, that, that allows us to do this. So um, it sort of keeps that machinery in good working order, whereas you know, our brain's not stupid. So if we stop using it, it literally downregulates the, all the, you know, the genes and things that were, are required to maintain that, and um, that has consequences. Um, it has consequences in our cognitive function, but it also likely has consequences in terms of how protected we are against degeneration and uh, disease. So there's reasons from that perspective. And so the other thing that comes out, if you, un if you take this perspective, is that if you're optimizing for brain health and brain function, then it's actually great to be terrible at something. 
right? You want to choose the thing where there's the most ca capacity for growth, right? So this can completely, you know, flip on its head how we might typically feel about things. So when, from this perspective, if you're terrible, if there's a huge gap between where you are now and some, you know, idealized version you want to be down the road, that's fantastic because that means there's a tremendous amount of growth that can happen, which will then translate to all these cognitive benefits uh, that you can accrue for it. And, and, you know, if you take that even further, you could argue if, if you're optimizing for brain health and not optimizing for mastery, once you reach a certain level, right, you're actually better off jumping to something, you know, whether it's a new instrument, a new genre, a new style and so forth, something that you're less familiar with rather than those, you know, finer points that we know make the difference between kind of being intermediate, advanced and a, and a master at something. So another useful perspective, I think, is particularly if you're someone who cares about the health of your brain and your, and your cognitive function. Absolutely. I'm really glad you shared that point. And I, I very much enjoyed your recent podcast episode. Um, Josh's podcast, Intelligence Unshackled, digs into all of this kind of stuff in more detail, not music specific, but often with musical examples. And I loved your episode on that because it, like you say, it totally flips on its head. And I think particularly for adult learners, anything we can do to make us feel okay about yeah. not being good at something is yeah. a really big benefit. It's a really exactly. important big thing. Yeah, And maybe we could talk a little bit about adult learning, because I know that at Brainjo you specialize not in teaching children the banjo, but teaching adults. And in particular, you know, we've talked about how playing by ear is possible to learn and some of the challenges we might encounter around motivation and some maybe different ways to think about why we're learning music. But you have a great post also sharing some quite solid reasons why you actually have advantages as an adult learner compared with, you know, the child you might envy who t you know, learns anything easily because children are a sponge. Right. I think we often come at it with that assumption. But as you point out, there are certain benefits to being an adult. Right. Yeah. So so there's a lot of um, there are a lot of sort of ideas and biases that, that I think a lot of people have about you know, the, the differences between an adult and a child when it comes to learning anything. And the sort of prevailing idea is heavily biased towards thinking that, you know, the childhood brain has, you know, kind of all the benefits and all the advantages. Um, and uh, I'd argue that that's, you know, there's, there may be some kernel of truth in some domains there, but much of what we've taken as kind of the accepted wisdom um, hasn't been proven and that there are alternative uh, hypotheses that haven't been tested uh, or explored. So there's that to say this idea that, that, um, that the child brain is inherently better at picking up something like music. Um, uh, I think you can, there, that's still an open question. Um, and there are definitely uh, advantages to, uh, that adults have. There's also uh, the fact that, that uh, much of what we've ascribed as uh, sort of uh, byproducts of the aging process in the brain um, have been shown to be reversible. So we don't really have an understanding of what true aging in the brain looks like yet. So until we even answer that question, um, it's, we, we, we should be careful to say what's possible and what isn't possible, right? So that's still research that needs to be done. And um, I'm uh, writing a paper with a, with a friend who that hopefully will be published on that topic about, about questioning what is true cognitive aging. But back to the distinction between the child and the adult who's trying to learn uh, a new instrument. So one thing that the what adults have uh, as an advantage is the parts of the brain that, uh, that are uh, involved with focus and attention are definitely more well-developed in the adult brain. So one of the things, one of the last areas to develop uh, in the human brain is the, are the frontal lobes typically, you know, end of teenage years, even into early 20s is when those fully mature. And that's the part of the brain that kind of um, sends the att attention signal to other parts to say, you know, what, th you know, this is, uh, th you need to, you need to change, you need to, you need to um, learn this new skill. So, and, and another, one of the things that I try to emphasize about uh, how we even conceive of practice is that, you know, practice is our time where we're, we're all we're really trying to do is send our brain a cue for what it's supposed to be working on. So almost all of our learning is happening, not when we're practicing or all the changes that support, you know, new skill acquisition happens, not when we're practicing, but when we're not practicing and mostly, mostly during sleep. So our primary purpose 
of practice in general is simply to tell the brain, these are the things I want you to be working on tonight, you know, and tomorrow night, whatever. Um, and the way in which we um, tag, so we have, you know, during the course of our day, we have gazillions of bytes of data coming at us, right? We're not going to store all that. That'd be stupid. And we, you know, we look, run, out of, run out of capacity. So we have to have mechanisms for tagging what's important, telling our brain, you know, what you, what you need to change for tonight and what you can discard and not worry about. And the, thing, the part of the brain that does that is our frontal lobe, and it does it through secreting a chemical called acetylcholine. And so it has these long projections that go out to different parts of the brain. And the parts that, are, you know, that, that it wants to, that, that, that's been processing information that it wants to stick, you know, it squirts more acetylcholine into that area to tell it, you know, tonight you're going to work, you're going to, you know, revisit this and learn it for tomorrow. And the adult brain is better at that. We have, that's the part of our brain that's more well-developed. Um, so we can uh, be much more efficient in how we use our practice uh, because of that. And uh, we all know, you know, you're probably some of the listeners are aware of the, phenomena, the the concept of deliberate practice, right? So that, so that um, you know, what, just, just practicing alone isn't really what you want. You wanna be actually you know, practicing on specific uh, things that you know are going to move the needle forward. And um, again, it's another, that's another area where an adult has an advantage in that they're able to sort of plan out a sequence um, more than a, ch a child brain can. Again, something that's, that's mediated by the frontal lobe. So you have this ability to focus and attend better. You also have the uh, ability to plan out your learning um, in ways that a, that a child brain doesn't. Um, and so really you're left with, you know, there are probably, if we think about anything that might be uh, sort of an inevitable byproduct of aging, uh, you know, you might could argue that processing speed um, is one thing that will slow down. So just the speed of transmission, um, which would affect may maybe your ability to um, you know how fast you could play how fast you can send a signal to your to your muscles um but it doesn't appear that that's w w if that's uh, significant if that if that's true that it's enough to to impact the music you can make in any meaningful capacity you might not be setting a world record for like how fast you can play a song right but um but for stuff that would matter for making music uh, it doesn't seem to matter so you know that's the that's one of the main advantages of the that if if there is one of the um of the childhood brain and then the other that people would may often think about is just the the the, the child brain the uh, childhood brain's capacity for plasticity. So how readily it's able to change itself in resp in, uh, in uh, response to experience. And you know we know that obviously childhood's a time of very rapid learning. Um, much of that is scripted, is developmentally scripted learning that happens. You know, learning to talk, learning to walk. So really, we're looking at what are the differences in the plasticity that supports general purpose learning. So music would be a category there, something that's not, you know, common across the human species. Um, and, you, you, you know, in general, we might see that in general purpose learning that you might see the, a childhood brain, if you kind of given the same, same type of practice, you know, controlling for all factors, a childhood brain may learn that faster. But what we've also learned is that plasticity itself is plastic. So meaning that uh, if, you, if, you have, if you are not on a pace of continuous learning throughout your life, we talked about this a little bit ago, your brain actually downregulates those mechanisms. So what we don't know is are those differences inevitable parts of aging or are those simply reflections of the natural course of, of a human life, which these days, you know, partly or a lot culturally, is heavily biased uh, towards you know, front loading the learning early in life. So we don't know, you know, if, if someone continuously learns throughout their life um, new things, as a child would be doing, who's continuously upregulating those general, general purpose learning mechanisms, are there going to be, are those differences still going to exist or not? So that's one of those questions that we don't even have an answer to. So suffice to say that, that, that um, keep, you know, it can, the best way to keep your brain in a childhood state is to, uh, and, and reap all the benefits of that you had then and the ones that you have now as an adult is simply to continue to acquire new skills and new capacities. Fantastic. And you are actively helping people do that with your work at the Brain Joe Collective. Could you talk a little bit about that project? Yeah, sure. So, um, so the Brain Joe Collective uh, started at the same time that um, I began the Intelligence Unshackled podcast. And the kind of the goal of that podcast um, and that whole mission is just to kind of talk about anything that relates to improving the health and function of the brain. So it was kind of a way to 
organize all the different hats that I wear under one umbrella and talk about things that really, you know, interest me the most. Um, and so the uh, collective was a way of uh, an a way of get, uh, allowing people to to um, support that that podcast, but also um, a, to to build a community of people who are kind of interested in these same sorts of things, um, so that we can all you know learn from each other. Um, and then one of the things that uh, I started as part of that uh, was what I've referred to as the uh, brain uh, brain Joe brain fitness challenges. So trying to sort of promote this idea that, you know, just as like we think with exercise, right? Uh, everybody's kind of takes it as an accepted wisdom that, you know, exercise is just inherently good for your body. So we do it, you know, most people who are going out biking or running, they're not going out to, you know, become Olympians. They're doing it for the, to improve the health of their body. Same way, uh, the same concept applies to the brain, but we haven't kind of widely embraced that idea. And so, if, you know, so I personally, you know, think that there's a lot of evidence to suggest that that's true and that, that new learning should be a continuous part of anyone's life if you're interested in, you know, protecting the brain and the, the health of the brain in the same way you'd protect the health of the body. And we all know the brain's more important anyway, so. Um, but uh, so, so I wanted to, so I started these Brain Joe Fitness Challenges as, as ways of kind of, as a group, um, we do some, uh, some new, uh, new form of learning that's, that's, the express purpose of which is to reap the sort of cognitive and brain health benefits, right? And so with, the, you know, the, the skill, skill acquisition being a happy byproduct. Um, and so the first one that we began uh, doing was a learn, uh, a learn the ukulele challenge. So we launched the, the collective launched in January. So I'm almost, we're almost finished with that, with that one, but that, so I've created a, a course for that that's um, similar to the other courses I've done with the with brain Joe, but in this case, really focusing on the intention being, you know, d doing it for for brain health and uh, specifically as the as the first priority. Very cool. And give people a taste of what it means that you made the course similar to your other courses. What's the inherent brain Joe philosophy or methodology that would make this different from your average ukulele for dummies book or video? Right, series? right, right. Um, so the I guess the, the the fundamental idea or concept for for Brain Joe was to uh, integrate what we learned about how the brain changes or neuroplasticity um, into a methodology for learning music, and it's and fun, essentially it's a learning framework that you could apply to anything. Music is a great place to apply it for a lot of reasons. Um, one being because it's a place where uh, the talent myth has been so pervasive, um, a great place to where if folks can demonstrate for themselves that it's not about aptitude, but about process, it's a really powerful illustration that this concept may apply to all other domains of their life. Um, so that was one of the um, motivations for starting it because I felt like, um, you know, I talked earlier about not having a path to be to going where I wanted to go. Um, and wanted to give people that and trying to create the, the, uh, the best or the uh, most effective path for doing so um, was the, the, the kind of the core idea behind Brain Joe. And, you know, fundamentally, all we're trying to do when, when we're learning an instrument or learning any new skill is change the brain. We're trying to, you know, create a version of the brain that can play whatever instrument that we're trying to play. Um, so obviously, the, the thing, and this would apply to all of education. The, mo the, the thing is, is what's the science of brain change? And anything that we're, that we're doing to educate is fundamentally trying to get at that question. It may have different ways of doing so, but it, to me, it made perfect sense that as we're learning about how the brain actually does this, this should be integrated into these into methodologies for learning, and music is a great place to do that. Another reason music is so great is because the um, feedback loop is so tight um, and uh, so immediately apparent. So you have lots of immediate feedback and you have a pretty steep learning curve. So it's a nice, it's a nice place to, um, to test uh, uh, this type of uh, methodology. So at any rate, the, the difference is then, you know, kind of how the, um, how the uh, content is organized. So the, a lot of what I would have encountered previously would be, you know, I would say these are the things that you need to learn, but, um, how to learn them and what sequence they are learned in wasn't really spelled out for me. And I realized, you know, 
both experientially uh, and you know understanding the neuroscience behind it that those two things matter a whole lot right so that that really the difference between somebody who makes it to where you know who continues to learn and to continues to progress and someone who doesn't is, is again not you know about the brain that they're born with but the one that they build and all of that's determined by the sequence of practice and how they go about practicing so if you're practicing in a way that leverages your brain's natural ability to change itself and moves it in the direction that you want it um, then the sky's the limit so that, that's um, so those concepts are kind of embedded into the into the, how the courses are delivered terrific and you have uh, several posts on your website sharing really great insights into improving practice or extending beyond practice and you know the the comment you made in passing a few minutes ago about how you can see practice time just as a way of giving your brain instructions on what to work on later that alone can transform how someone thinks about practice yes and i'd love if we could talk about a couple more of the ideas that you you cover on the brain joe site one of which is visualization mm -hmm. and that's you know that that conceptually has come up on the show before but not in quite the way you talk about it. So I wonder if you could share how visualization is a part of your own practice or what you teach the, the students of the Brain Joe Methods. Yeah, so uh, I, I'm a huge fan of visualization. I think it's, I wrote uh, the article, I, I first wrote an article in a magazine about it and it was, it was uh, you know, um, uh, giving the analogy between visualization and using the force. Like, you know, as a kid, I'd always wanted to be Luke Skywalker and change things, change things in the world with my mind. And, and literally that's, it's what we're able to do. I mean, the, the, you know, the, it's pretty astonishing the, the research on it that simply thinking about something, you can change your brain, you know? So, um, and, and the, uh, the research specifically on, on music uh, and other forms of skill learning is that when you're visualizing uh, first person visualization of engaging in some activity, you're activating almost all of the same areas of the brain as you are when you're doing the actual activity. So, and you can, and there are also studies that are showing that the benefits of doing so that the improvements um, sort of the, uh, you know, the uh, external metrics of improvement um, as well as the neurological or neurophysiological correlates of those improvement um, change uh, re whether or not you are visualizing or actually doing practice um, versus if someone you know if you have if you compare across groups you know the visualization group and the practice groups will improve and then the ones that, that don't practice don't so you can get many of the same benefits um, as a physical practice uh, with simply with visualization it's important one of the things i always emphasize to make sure we're not you know, some people think of visualization like, you know, imagine yourself winning the trophy or something like that. But here we're trying, you know, you're not just visualizing a third person perspective on yourself, but it's super important to actually visualize a first person perspective. Um, and so if you can, if you uh, think about yourself, you know, thinking about throwing a ball with your non-dominant hand and really trying to think, feel that uh, visually, um, or think about switching your knife and fork and cutting a piece of steak and how that would feel. If you can feel, if you can feel, you should be able to feel that kind of awkwardness. It tells you, kind of gives you a glimpse of how powerful the visualization mechanism is. Um, but if you can feel that, then you've kind of got the right idea. So I use it, and I still use it all the time for practicing. So it's a great way to, um, to uh, practice when you're, when you're otherwise engaged in something you don't want to be engaged in, or <laughs> it's a nice distraction. But there's also, um, and so in addition to just sort of uh, giving yourself uh, additional um, practice moments that you wouldn't otherwise have, I think there's a, there's a particular benefit in using visualization for developing ear learning. Um, because in order to actually visualize, so if I'm trying to visualize a particular piece of, you know, that I've learned on the banjo, um, and if I'm doing it correctly, I'm visualizing the movements that I'm making and I'm visualizing the sound as I'm doing it. And what we're truly trying to do, uh, the sort of the ultimate goal for uh, someone who's learning by ear is uh, to create what I, what I've referred to as musical fluency, where you're taking the, um, you're taking imagined sounds in your mind and mapping those onto the movements of your limbs. And in order to visualize, you have to do that. You have to be able to be, you know, taking an imagined sound and mapping it onto the movements that you're making. So you're building those um, those connections between just sound and motor maps that you don't have to do when you have your instrument in hand. Um, so it's a way of it's a it's a it's so it's a specifically a way I think of it's even better than um, 
than just regular practice for for that particular purpose. Um, and then if you if you find yourself you know unable to either recall how it how it's supposed to go or recall the movements, um, then you, it gives you a kind of a, a clear idea of what things you need to focus on, and then you can retry visualizing and seeing it. So uh, visualization is also a nice metric of how you of of your improvement in that area as well. But um, it's a reminder that if you if you can do that, then you're on your way towards towards building the kind of networks that you want for ear learning. And one last thing that I think is really helpful along these lines um, is to, in terms of this particular process, is recording yourself playing something that you've learned and then listening to those um, while you're away from your instrument and seeing if you can visualize. I think you'll find um, that you'll almost naturally do it. So if, you've, if you're listening to a piece that you've actually played, you'll actually start to, most people will start to just visualize themselves playing it as they're doing it. So you can, it's another way to test sort of the ear capacity um, is if you're able to, if you're able to visualize what you're doing as that music is playing, um, then you can, then that's another way of working on that um, those those mappings but it's also an easy way because it kind of naturally kicks in the visualization process yeah cool well it, it's that ear impact that i think is often glossed over when people talk about the visualization you know it, it's often talked about in the context of stage fright or performance anxiety and obviously there are huge benefits there but the kind of mental play exercise of imagining yourself playing it and hearing yourself playing it and as you say, making that connection between the sound you intend to make and the sound you actually make and what your fingers need to do right. is a really valuable part that we shouldn't ignore. I should say too that, so um, it work, I mean, it's, it's, to me, it's a still, still amazing how, how, it, how similar it feels to visualize something than to, as, as compared to playing it. And so for the, the way I use it now is if I have some piece that's, that has just a section that's particularly tricky, um, I can just visualize it, just practice by visualizing as a means of getting better. And this dovetails with a, with a, the, the labyrinth technique that I've talked about, talked about, but, um, but, uh, you know, it's that, you know, just, just rehearsing a particular tricky passage is another really great way to use visualization. And one last thing I should mention before, while we're on this topic, um, doing it before bed is really uh, a, a great idea because uh, we talk about what the brain's gonna decide to work on that night. It does tend to prioritize or triage information according to the time. Um, so things that have occurred, it gives a little bit of bias towards things that have occurred closer to bedtime. So a great way as you're falling asleep, um, if you have some little piece that you're working on or some tricky passage is to visualize it uh, as you're going to sleep. It may even work as a sleep aid as well. So. That's a great tip. And we can't leave people hanging for too long if they haven't been to your website and learned about the labyrinth technique could you explain what that is and why it's relevant here yeah so it's another one of those things that when you think about it it seems obvious but I mean, it's it's um it's still overlooked a lot even myself even myself i have to remind myself to do it so it comes from the game uh, the the name comes from the game labyrinth which is um, I don't know if some of the listeners are familiar with it. It's where you have that, uh, you have this sort of a, a, a board that has a marble on it and you, you have to navigate a maze. You can uh, change the tilt of the board with little knobs that are on the, on the um, sides of a box and you're trying to navigate the um, marble through a big maze without it falling in little holes that are designed to trap it. Um, and so I was, uh, my son had gotten Labyrinth as a birthday gift. This was a few years ago. So he was maybe like, five or six and uh, we were having a contest to see you know who could get the furthest in the game and um, there was this one little tricky uh, section you know that we neither of us could get through and so you know what we were doing it was we you'd get to it and it was probably like it took you maybe like you know two or three minutes to get to that section right people who play video games are familiar with this idea you have to go all the way back to the start right to go <laughs> to, to go back to the thing that is giving you trouble um so that you would we you know we get to that part and then we put our marble all the way back well you know we we learned how to navigate all that part of the section all that part of the maze getting up to that particular point it was just we had to figure out the maneuvers to get past that tricky part um so what i was so after, so what i did was i took the you know the game and i was like wait a second why don't i just drop the marvel right to the you know right right at the at the start of this tricky section and just figure that out 
And then I'll go back and figure, and of course that, that worked, right? It shortened, dramatically shortened the amount of time it would have taken to, to master that little part. And the same exact thing, and it's something that I'd been doing with music as well, but I realized that I, you know, hadn't instinctively, you know, at first decided this is obviously the way you're supposed to do this, you know, um, and, but it makes perfect sense. But it's, again, overlooked a lot in music as whereas, as if, you know, we have a new song that you're trying to play. And if you look in, and, you, you know, if you're having trouble with it in some capacity, it's usually just, you know, a measure or two or some particular area. It's rarely the entire piece that you have trouble with. And yet what we often do is when we practice is we play the whole thing, you right? And then, and then what even worse oftentimes happens is that we try to, you know, uh, gloss over the part that's giving us trouble, right? We try <laughs> speed, that's when people speed up uh, or, you know, or just, you know, fuzz the notes together or whatever. Whereas what the, the way to, you know, the better way to handle that is simply to focus on that particular section, right? So to, so to isolate, you know, where am I having trouble and just focus on that. And that can, if you going from not doing that to doing that will exponentially, you know, reduce your, your practice time. So, and that's where I was saying, I, that same technique can be applied to visualization. So if you have a practice session, you know what little part you need to work on, just visualize that. You'll be surprised that if it's tricky for you playing your instrument, it will be hard to visualize it uh, correctly. And then you will make the same improvements that you would make, you know, if you were actually practicing with your instrument. And then you go back to it and that part's gotten a lot easier. And you said something similar in that same context of, visualizing kind of revealing problem spots or opportunities mm -hmm. which was that it can do the same for recall and are you actually memorizing have you remembered the piece well right. enough yeah i know that's a, a big bugbear for a lot of our audience and you know it plays into this conversation we're having about adult learning in particular mm -hmm. where a lot of people are concerned that generally their me memory isn't great memorizing music's arguably a big part of becoming a good musician. Maybe music's not for me because I won't be able to memorize all that stuff. How do you think about that? Or what does the research show on this topic of memorizing and music? Is there any any good advice you can offer to help people with that? Yeah, um, and I agree. It's a, it's a, it's a bar musical memory is a barrier for folks and oftentimes an unrecognized barrier. So get it's particularly um, people who would say they have a really hard time remembering or memorizing uh, a song that they've played and it's and you know it's not so much they forget the mechanics of it but they're actually forgetting the song um, so it's important to actually recognize you know what what where is the difficulty I think folks who come to an instrument with at least some musical background or they've been singing a long time or they're just used to to, to having a repertoire in their memory that they pull from, it's not an issue. So it's, it's one reason why I think it can be a hidden, hidden barrier for, for some is that they don't, it hasn't really been recognized that that's a, that can be a crucial distinction for some folks. So, uh, so the, the piece that I wrote about it was, you know, first talking about kind of what are kind of the signs that this may be something to specifically work on because, uh, you know, I, I don't, I never encountered that as a real topic in musical instruction. Um, but it's, it's, it's obviously a prerequisite for so much of what we do. So uh, being able to remember how the music goes. Um, so, you know, but just like anything else, it's a, it's a skill that can be developed, but it's one that you know, requires specific practice on it uh, to do so. So just as you, would cr you could create a body of uh, you know, recordings of yourself that you would use to you know, determine whether or not, or to use to, you know, practice visualization or actually pr practice the, the mechanics of, of playing the song, you can you use the same concept to try to build your musical memory. So, you know, keep, if you're, if you have a, if you have, um, you know, particular songs that you're working on, you know, keep a playlist somewhere, keep a list somewhere, test yourself, right? Just, just say, can I, can I sing through this start to finish and, and keep the melody in mind? And uh, if you can't, then that's obviously that's something to practice. And uh, and to continue to just as you practice any other part of music, but I the I think the for me the the most critical uh, point to recognize is that that in and of itself is its own unique skill, um, and if you if you don't recognize it uh, as a as a particular skill and don't develop it, it can kind of undermine a lot of other stuff without you realizing it. Yeah, it, it's kind of one of those um, lurking. 
I don't want to say speed bumps, but it's it's almost like a speed limiter, isn't it? That you don't realize you're being held back by your from your actual learning potential right. by this thing that, as you say, is often not explicitly addressed in mm -hmm. the learning process. Yeah. Yeah. I think in that article, I wrote the sort of the, the pie of musical knowledge and there's the things that we know we know, the things that we know that we don't know. And then there are the things that we don't know that we don't know. And those are the hidden, those are all the hidden barriers. And, you know, we want that piece to be as small as possible, but, and, and that's where, you know, that's where the, the brain Joe method, that's where the articles come in is, is trying to, you know, try to figure out what's the scope of all the possible knowledge that you may, you know, that you, that, that needs to be uh, attended to. Well, it's clear by now, I'm sure, for anyone watching or listening, that your expertise in music learning and practice methodology and the brain implications of music learning goes way beyond the banjo. But obviously, banjo is your primary instrument. It's front and center in a lot of what you do. Yes. Do people naturally know if banjo is the instrument for them? Hmm. It sounds uh, like it just kind of clicked for you and you were drawn to it in a way. Is that normal in your experience? Actually, I think it is. There's, um, there's definitely tends to be a sort of banjo player phenotype um, that there's a lot of, and, and actually one reason I, I enjoy banjo camp so much is because it's like, these are, these are my people. You know, I can just, there's so much in common. So there probably is some kind of universal, you know, banjo affinity uh, traits that are that are lurking out there, but um, but yeah, I was, and it and it may be different things for different people, um, but you know, for me, it's it's it would started out with the the sound of the banjo it was just so different and unique, and um, I just you know it, it just knew it, you know, it would just love to try to you know make sounds with with that thing. It just sounded so so interesting, um, but I also there's there are other things about sort of how the banjo has been traditionally used um, in in music where it's rarely front and center, it's kind of a sporting role. Um, and just sort of its, its history as well is, is really rich. Um, and a lot of people connect with that part of it uh, as well. So there, I think there are a few reasons that really attract people, but I do think that, uh, that it is one of those instruments that people too tend, tend to have a real affinity for kind of right, off the, right out of the gate. Cool. Well, in that case, let's leave people with very clear direction. If they're a banjo, um, a banjo fan or player or aspiring player, where should they go to learn more about your projects? And yeah. if they're not particularly banjo oriented, but they're fascinated by all of the kind of brain science and practice methodology we've been talking about, uh -huh. where's the best place for them? Sure. So um, the the best place if they're kind of globally interested in all you know, the connections between neuroscience neuroplasticity music learning all this stuff the the principles behind it um you can you can go to lawsofbrainjo.com and that will direct you to the menu for for the um the articles that i've written on the topic which are which are housed actually on at the moment at least on clawhammerbanjo.net so uh clawhammer banjo uh is the first uh, brain Joe course that I that I created and it's one style of uh, banjo and then uh, the next um, course uh, was um, speaking of playing other styles and genre um, was is fingerstylebanjo.com so you know the other the other uh, ways of thinking about it is claw hammer is down picking and fingerstyle is up picking so uh, down picking banjo banjoists go to clawhammerbanjo.net and and up picker up picking enthusiasts can go to fingerstylebanjo.com Fantastic. And I'll, I'll just throw in a big recommendation myself. If, if you're watching this or listening to this, you're a podcast fan in some sense. So definitely do check out the Intelligence Unshackled podcast. I've been diving into the back catalogue myself with great enthusiasm. And there's a lot of really juicy ideas in there to transform how you think about learning and brain development. Huge thank, thank you, you, Josh, for joining us on the show today. Yeah, thank you for having me. I really enjoyed it. Oh, hey, one more thing. If you enjoyed this video, please take a second to like it on YouTube. And if you haven't already, please also subscribe to our channel there. That's going to help make sure you get all our latest videos as soon as they come out. And it also helps us reach more people, which means more episodes, better guests, and everybody wins. So please take a second to like this video and hit subscribe.